company, the telecommunication companies provide banking services on the phone. So this one, it's a model that works well in the rural areas because most people have mobile phones and the okay. technology, is, um, if you, all you have to do is just uh, use your phone and go maybe to an agent and put money, give money, they deposit for you. You okay. can send money, you can receive money. So it's, um, it's, a, it's one of the major ways that banking is done there. And okay. also microfinance institutions such as um, uh, there's a banking, there's a bank specifically for women known as the Kenya Women Finance Bank. Okay. So it was set up to empower women. So that's um, one of the banks that um, are prevalent in the, in the rural areas in Kenya. Uh, another way that people bank is through, so there's self-help groups. But now in Kenya, there's this ta tailored um, way called Chama. Chama okay. is a Swahili word that means a group of people. So a group of people come together and then they do a merry-go-round um, sort of uh, setup where one person um, uh, gives money. Uh, I mean, a group of people give money to one person when it's maybe um, in eight months, the first month, eight other people will give to um, one person. Like that, like it's a merry-go-round. And this setup is actually really uh, prevalent in um, such areas because most of their incomes are little incomes, they're not a lot. So, so and you can do more when, when it, there is a collective amount. So this term, as you even find in Kenya, rather than the 32% that, is, uh, that people have uh, 32 percent of people have bank uh, have bank accounts rather than 41 percent of chamas. Even the banks, um, the major banks, have kept curtailed for the chamas where they're providing. You can open a, an account like an account for the chama, the group now. So yeah, that's what's happening with the banking. And when it comes to trading, the rural areas, the major economic activity here in Kenya is agriculture. So uh, and most women do subsistence farming. Um, so there are various challenges when it comes to this, uh, when carrying out the modern trading and banking. For example, in the agricultural sector, um, uh, there is, because of the various systematic and environmental risks, uh, the, uh, it's not consistent when it comes to the money that they gain from it. And then another one is also as I mentioned before, the traditional and social, uh, uh, cultural practices that is practiced with the customary law, um, it, it makes women not own land. And you know, when you don't have land rights, you don't have uh, uh, participation, you lack working capital, and henceforth, you lack access to credit. And because when you have land, you can borrow a loan, you can, um, you can sell the land, but now the women in the rural areas don't um, have primary rights when it comes to the land. So that's one of the uh, challenges. Another one is um, the high interest rates. Um, so women here complain of the, maybe the, like the Kenya Women Finance Bank, they claim that the interest rates that they're given on the loans are high. Uh, and some of them are not even uh, had to repay loans uh, because they were the guarantors. So they had to repay loans of the defaulters. So that was one, one of the issues because they, they were not aware of what being a guarantor meant. So, one of the, um, my conclusion was that uh, the government should increase investments when it comes to education, health systems and infrastructure so that the woman, the rural woman, when those things are um, upgraded, their quality of life is upgraded, they have more economic uh, status, they have more uh, purchasing power and it um, generally increases their quality. Uh, better policies when it comes to the better policies and tariffs when it comes to the agricultural sector. Because um, the problem with the agricultural sector, we are now competing with imports. So if they um, put harsher regulations when it comes to imports, uh, so that the agricultural sector in Kenya can be, can be favored there. Um, another one is also the women uh, need to be sensitized when it comes to the, uh, their rights, when it comes to their land rights, so that they are aware of the rights that they are given in the various laws uh, and also they need to be trained uh, on better farming practices so that they can earn income because they do subsistence farming 
they can do like maybe value addition activities um, such as if they plant maize they can make flour um, also the employment in the various industries which is mainly seasonal work in the farms and uh, uh, casual labor they can give better pay and they can also uh, be more flexible because the rural woman um, is a caregiver and she's the one who takes care of her home and when she's doing the farming she's doing it so that she can feed her family so if they can provide a, a, a way in which the woman can be able to um, cater for her family and at the same time also earn money from the same um, activity farming activity that I mean subsistence farming that they're doing and also or maybe they can work maybe after they've taken care of the family they can work now after like in this um, uh, moder modernized uh, countries where women uh, well uh, it's a 24-hour economy and people can work maybe at night or part-time and things like that. So, and also the customary law that is inconsistent with the constitution of Kenya should be um, eradicated with. So, yeah, and also just sensitization and enforcement of the various policies and laws and attitudes of the people of the rural areas. All right. So, All right, thank you so much, Patricia, for your um, in-depth explanation. Um, so the next thing we'll be talking about is um, designing and implementation of policies to protect the enjoyment of women's rights. Now, um, this is one particular aspect I am very um, passionate about because um, laws make or mar a system. And we've seen countries across the globe ratify certain laws, um, domesticate those laws, but there is a problem in implementation or applicability as the case may be. So um, this is to Claudia. Um, what's the situation like in Malaysia uh, when it comes to designing and implementation of policies to protect the enjoyment of women's rights? Because as we all know, women's rights um, are subdivided into social, economic, civil, and political rights, and even cultural rights. So what's the situation like in Malaysia? What has the government done when it comes to safeguarding so, these rights? Um, so basically, like I mentioned earlier, we've had a few quite um, big things that have changed. So like the Const federal constitution of Malaysia, um, the article, So that's quite a big thing. And then um, also we've had, it's, it's mainly because, um, so NGOs and is, have been helping to promote these issues. And so because of these things, um, yeah, it, it's a lot better. So, okay, I'll give you another one, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which has been ratified in 1995, which I mentioned earlier. Um, this one is quite a big one because it, it talks about civil rights and legal status of women. So their right to vote, the whole public office, right to non-discrimination in education, employment. Um, then it also focuses on reproductive rights and um, so like maternity protection, uh, right to reproductive choice, um, shared responsibility factors uh, influencing gender relations. So um, things like modifying the traditional roles of women in, in the family and um, removing gender stereotypes from school programs, uh, textbooks and teaching methods. So, this is actually quite a big thing that happened in Malaysia. Um, and then we've also had the establishment of the Ministry of Women and Family and uh, Community Development. This one, one of the big functions of this ministry is to review the existing laws and regulations in Malaysia and to suggest new legislation um, that they, they are able to afford better protection uh, for the livelihood and development of women. So 
that's quite a big thing as well. Um, then also the government has set up a high level committee um, initially chaired by the Prime Minister, but now it's uh, by someone else, um, look into issues concerning women's rights and women um, in development. So one of the outcomes of this high level community, uh, co committee, sorry, uh, was the creation of what uh, came, came to be known as gender focal points, GFPs, uh, each ministry and government agency. So that was quite a big thing. Um, and then rural women in Malaysia actually have the right under the constitution um, to inherit okay. men. Um, most ethnic groups uh, have their own customary laws regarding inheritance um, and they have matriarchal favoring women by restricting ownership and inheritance of tribal lands to uh, female members. So, but uh, one, one massive thing is the, that Malaysia is not a signatory of ILO Indigenous uh, and Tribal Peoples Convention. So that means basically that um, Malaysia is not bound or not obligated to protect Indigenous communities. So they, the Indigenous women are experiencing quite a lot of um, barriers to accessing healthcare, uh, protection and then financial services, things like that. Um, yeah, so that's uh, they're quite vulnerable in that sense, and um, things need to be done there. Um, but otherwise, Malaysia recognizes the right for uh, a man and woman to hold separate properties, even when married. So, in case of divorce, both men and women are entitled to claim for division of matrimonial assets. Um, other things like national agricultural uh, policy, NEP, um, to enhance women's involvement in agricultural and rural development. This um, intent was to increase labor uh, and participation involving women in horticultural enterprises as well as other occupations um, requiring skill. Um, and then other things such as um, Agencies such as the Department of Agriculture and Farmers Organizations Authority um, have been involved heavily in supporting women's rural micro enterprises and since the launch of um, Malaysia's plan. So a large number of microfinance uh, trainings and instruments in the country does not reach the most vulnerable community. That's an issue. Um, operating in isolation, lacking institutional affiliation, these services have showed a predisposition towards grooming uh, big leading to uh, neglect of uh, smaller and more segregated communities. So there are things like this going on here, but basically um, we have all these policies in place, we have all these um, laws in place. Uh, but I would say that it's still not implemented quite as well, like you said, Gladys, earlier. It's not um, executed quite properly. So a lot of the rural women in Malaysia are not um, accessing these rights, basic rights, like healthcare and education and even. So a lot needs to be done there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claudia. So um, last month, the UN Women or the United Nations actually released um, a statement or a report where it tried to gauge um, gender equality in the world. And then it says how many countries on the planet have um, been able to accomplish or um, have a gender equal society. And there was none. So um, that's that, that brings to mind what you just said now. Um, we have these laws in place, we have strategies in place, however, not so much has been done with respect to implementation. I think this boils down to a lot of factors such as patriarchy, such as lack of resources, such as um, harmful discriminatory practices and discriminatory legislation. Thank you so much, Claudia. So um, our next speaker, 
Um, but before we do that, I see Mrs. Adefunke from Nigeria has joined us. So good to have you, Ma. Good afternoon. Um, so we'll move over to the next discussion, and that's from Nishta Sanduja. So she'll be telling us about um, design and implementation of policies to protect the enjoyment of women's rights in India. And after that, she will be telling us about equal participation of rural women in decision-making process. So she would have a two-in-one presentation. Right, right. So thank you so much. And um, as it is over to me now, I'd uh, begin by the second one first. So which is equal participation of rural women in the decision-making process. So when we are talking about decision-making process, I believe that in voting rights being granted to these women, then the representation, representation rights being granted to these women to be a part of the government, of the legislature. And beyond this, it also involves that women must have certain active participation when it comes to political activism. That is, they must be able to form themselves in groups and communities such that even when they do not form part of the government, are they able to press their demands in such a way uh, that they are heard? You know, so I'm going to be discuss it, discussing this particular topic in this particular analogy. So coming over to the voting rights. So in India, as in many other countries now as well, universal suffrage was given to men and women alike with the coming of the constitution in the 1950. And this has been elucidated under the article 326 of the Indian constitution. So men and women have equal voting rights available and one vote by a man or a woman has equal worth uh, in the eyes of the law. So that is what we mean by equal voting rights being granted to women over 18 years of age. Coming over to representation of women in politics. Now to ensure that the rural women in specific get represented well, India has granted them one third reserved seats in the local governments. So India is a federal nation where we have a three-tier system of government. So we have a central government, then a state government, and then the last and the final tier, which is the local self-help government. And this local self-help government is existing both for the rural and the urban areas. So both for these rural and urban areas, we have one-third seats reserved for women in this third tier of government. And let me now tell you what are the sources based on which the legal sources based on which we could grant such kind of, um, you know, these reserved seats to women that are 33.3 a source being article 14 of our Indian constitution that talks about right to equality. And when it talks about right to equality, it speaks about both equality before law and equal protection of laws. And as part of these equal protection of laws, so India has, you know, accepted this particular notion that equality can only be there for equals. If a five-year-old and a 10-year-old, for example, are granted the same portion size of food, that will not be equality to them. So in order to provide equality, they need to be, uh, you know, understood in their own independent uh, respective terms and their nutritional needs. So similarly, the Constitution of India mandates that sometimes, just sometimes, we require to have certain positive discrimination and certain classification to that particular regard that uh, some people will be given a little differential treatment in order to basically provide them equality. So women have been granted that particular classified status, that particular positive discrimination based on which they have been granted these reserved seats in India. Now, mind you that these reserved seats are only there in the local uh, uh, bodies, the local government bodies, that is the third tier. However, the Indian women are still fighting, including the rural women, are still fighting the rights to be granted these uh, reserved seats in the state and the center legislatures as well. And that is called the 108th Constitutional Amendment Bill. And it is still lying pending. And uh, it first came into place in 1996. 
So it is still a long-standing battle for women. Uh, and these reserved seats are also required to be granted to these women, considering the socio-economic milieu of our country. And I believe all of our countries for that matter, because we all are developing nations on here on the portal today. So, uh, I mean, this is a matter of fact that we are intrinsically patriarchal. There's a lot of muscle power and criminalization involved in politics. And women were not getting represented well. So this classification, this positive discrimination was henceforth required. The next source of the constitution why this based on which this representation is provided to these women is article 15, clause three, which states that the government has all prerogatives and all rights to make certain special provisions for women and children of our country in order to uplift them. And this will not be considered discriminatory. Also, so we had an article uh, we'd not had, we still have it, but its eminence was much more in the history. So we had an article, Article 40 in place, which spoke about the Panchayati Raj institutions being set up in India, meaning the local health governments for the rural India. They have been given the terminology Panchayati Raj institutions. So initially we just had this Article 40 in place and it is only in 1992 that an actual 73rd amendment came into place and made it a mandate that every state, every district is supposed to have these particular Panchayati Raj institutions and these Panchayati Raj institutions are supposed to provide all its women these one third reserved seats. So it is only in 1992 that these reserved seats came into picture by the 73rd Amendment. And that is the most flawless, uh, you know, stance or empowerment provision politically that has been provided to rural women in India. Swiftly coming over to the political activism that I was talking about. So Indian women, specifically the rural ones, have, uh, you know, uh, have illustrated beautiful examples of uh, political activism as well. And one such striking example has been the 1970s Chipko movement, where rural women of Uttarakhand, they literally held all the trees very dear. They hugged them and stood there endlessly for days in order to um, you know, speak up and raise their voice uh, regarding the deforestation that was occurring in the state. And the state government had to actually, uh, their demands were pressed upon the state governments and they actually had to take up certain, uh, you know, remedies to remedify the situation of so much industrialization occurring in the state of Uttarakhand. And there have been many such examples. The Narmada Bachao Andolan occurred here when a dam was getting created on the river Narmada and a lot of rural people were losing out on their livelihoods. So again, these rural women, they went and they stood up there and they literally let the water flow over their heads. And they kept standing there until the government heard their demands to provide them optimum compensation. So they were able to increase their own bargaining power, even without being within the legislature. So that is what I mean by women uh, having to have certain decision making capacity by standing in unison and solidarity with one another, specifically rural women. And rural women have also stood up uh, in times of tragedies that have, that have occurred in India, like uh, this recent 2012 New Delhi rape case that occurred that created a nationwide, not just a nationwide, but a worldwide stir. It even, uh, you know, uh, made the government literally sit down and amend the rape laws in our country. And rural women had a lot much participation in their protests. However, just as a conclusive remark, I'd like to state that uh, this was all about the political participation of women. However, we need to take up a very multi-dimensional approach if we want to uplift our women, the Indian rural women. And that multi-dimensional approach uh, uh, is that we're supposed to have better laws in place for them so that they feel secure. We need to afford them certain financial help and uh, certain socio-economic uh, strengths so that they're able to make themselves financially independent. We are supposed to have stringent laws in place so that uh, women feel themselves to be secure and there are no fines being committed against them. And uh, with that multi-dimensional approach, I'll be starting up with my policy next topic, which is your designing and implementation of policies such that women are able to enjoy their rights 
better. So this is my next topic now. And before I begin on topic of, talking about uh, how social legally and every otherwise uh, and the welfare schemes that the government has set up for rural women specifically in place so that they're able to enjoy their rights. I would just go ahead and state a theory by a famous psychologist, Maslow. So he had given a certain hierarchy of needs that are basically required for every human being, both men and women, to be able to live a very self-actualized life. So Maslow stated that it's only when, a, when somebody, including a woman, when she's self-actualized, will she be able to enjoy all her rights better and live a very fulfilled life. So he gave a, a pyramid tier where the topmost tier of the pyramid speaks about a self-actualized man or a woman. And the lower rungs of that pyramid need a mention over here before we start discussing the policies because this is the theory that should help us implement laws, not just in India, but worldwide from an international perspective. So he stated that the primary needs of the human being are physiological first, that is we require food, clothing, shelter. Then he said that we require the second tier is safety needs. We want a home over our head. We want certain, uh, our health and our nourishment in short. We want certain property rights in our country. Then the third tier comes that we require to feel uh, belonged to some place. So belongingness rights. We need to have a family, a partner, certain rights in marriages. Uh, you know, we need to feel safe within the confines of our home. And uh, all those domestic violence instances need to be dealt with and punished very stringently. So all those form part of need for belongingness. And then comes the final one, esteem needs where uh, you require a respect for yourself, for your self-esteem, for your self-confidence. And that can only come up when women, including the rural women in all of our countries, are able to work independently and earn their own bread and butter. And it's only after that, that when women will become self-actualized and will be able to enjoy their rights. So coming over to what India has done legally to strengthen the stance of women in our country. So we have multiple laws in place and India has been one country that it has always learned from its own mistakes and from its own uh, historical uh, you know, milieu. So initially in the 1970s again, we started to have a lot of dowry debts in India. So dowry is an Indian concept where uh, it's like a bride price that you pay uh, to the uh, husband of this particular daughter of yours that you're wanting to marry, that you're wanting to uh, get married. So it, it's a bride price. And women uh, were facing a lot of cruelty in their marriages owing to this dowry as a custom in India. So dowry prohibition laws was made stricter. Then women were facing domestic violence, both married and unmarried women. So domestic violence laws came into picture. And the most striking feature of the Domestic Violence Act in India is that uh, the economic uh, abuse considers this particular thing also as an economic abuse. If you're not allowing your woman to step out of the house and earn a means of living for herself, that will be considered economic abuse. And it is punishable under the law, under this DV Act. Uh, by the Indian laws. Then coming over to the marital ages of women. So we have set the marital age of women at 18 years, which is the voting age also for women in India. However, there's been an ongoing debate to increase this particular age to 21 years of age based on UNESCO's uh, you know, advice to India, because India still sees multiple child marriage instances. So that has been made stricter. This law is ongoing. So since the uh, sex ratio between men and women is also much of a problem, just like all other countries that are over here on the panel, the same problem persists for India as well. The female fetus is not really preferred because having the female is a very expensive deal. You have to pay the bride price to get her married. You have to pay for her education. And there's, there's always a payment that you have to you owe to her. So a male child is preferred in India. Owing to that, prenatal sex diagnostic, diagnostic tests have been banned pan-India. You cannot get the prenatal determination of sex done. This was done specifically to avert the instances of female feticide and of infanticide in India. 
So these are certain laws in place. Then the rape laws, as I told you, after the uh, 2012 instance, the gang rape, the Delhi gang rape, they have been made stricter. Women have been granted much more rights when it comes to maintenance and divorce cases. So all those acts are there. And now I'll be coming over to very briefly on just some of the welfare schemes that have been started by the government uh, that are absolutely eminent in our discussion today. So one of the most important, again, pan-India scheme is uh, Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao Yojana. It translates to, so this is Hindi, and it translates to teach the girl child and save the girl child. So in this scheme, the government has made endeavors to train the local governments, that are the Panchayati Raj rural governments, in order to let them know all the laws that are prevalent for a, a girl child and a woman in our country and to dispense that information further on, especially in the rural areas. Because see, uh, we have already spoken about what is a rural but to me I think our country always from the urban woman so the difference from the difference between these two only lies in the fact of the kind of opportunities that are being provided to them the kind of internet based sources or other kinds of media that that, that an urban woman has but uh, a woman staying in a village that those are the rural areas do not really have so which is why communication needs to be done about the laws in place why are these kind of schemes and via the government itself. So this scheme uh, does that. Then it ensures that, uh, so in India, this is a law that the primary education is free and mandatory. And this Beti Pachao, Beti Parhao Yojana ensures that separate, uh, you know, sanitation processes are taken care of within schools so that more and more girls can go to schools and get literate in the first place because illiteracy again is a problem in India. Yeah. So they are making separate washrooms for women. They are providing sanitary napkins to the women who go to school, uh, like older girls. Um, then they are providing certain, um, you know, tax benefits and cash incentives to the parents who are sending their children to schools. So there's a Ludley scheme. Ludley meaning a beloved girl. So there's a beloved girl scheme in India based on which uh, if a parent enrolls their kid, their female child into school and allows them to study until the 12th grade, they are provided cash incentives of close to one lakh of Indian rupees, which mind you is a huge sum for the rural person. So these things have been strengthened. Then in India, um, based on this Beti Bachao uh, I'm so sorry, I would have to pause you there. Um, so we have some questions trickling in, and okay. I think they're in line with um, some of the points you've made. Okay. All right. um, so in the course of the program, you'll okay. be able to answer them or respond to them promptly. Um, so welcome, right. sure. Mrs. Adefunke. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Mrs. Adefunke is a lawyer, a humanitarian, and a gender issues advocate in Nigeria. So she will be speaking briefly to us um, about property rights of rural women in Nigeria and, of course, um, involvement of rural women in decision-making process. Are they really involved in decision-making process in our country or is the narrative different? Hello, good afternoon all. To start with, you see, the rural women need enabling policy environments where gender issues can be addressed. Because one of the major challenges rural women do encounter, in Nigeria especially, you know, is discrimination and stereotyping. To be frank with you, here in our country, we don't have equal participation of women in decision making. We don't. Nigeria is quite few women, you know, in politics that are really active in decision making. Even in the world, I can really say the percentage of women, especially rural women, is quite low. So on these notes, I, I propose that women need, rural women need enabling policy environments where they can address gender disparity and discrimination you know, that exists across different sectors. 
including agriculture, rural development, trade opportunities, education, health and environment, social protection. Rural women need so social protection a lot. They need, they, need they need access to productive resources. They need training, they need information, you know, they need equal opportunities. You know, this, this, this woman contributes greatly, you know, to our economy. Yes, they are the ones being discriminated against, you know, times without number, you know. In my country, rural women has not really been faring well at all. You know, like I said, she has suffered discrimination, you know, she has been denied access to opportunities, social amenities, and all that. So in my own opinion, if women, if rural women can be, you know, there's a saying that, you know, when you train a woman, you train the whole nation. So in my own opinion, I feel what we can do, you know, to strengthen the rural women, you know, and encouraging them in decision making is number one, awareness. Yes, we need to create awareness. We need to take our education to the grassroots level, to the rural women, you know, to our children. It is when, you know, it, 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 it is when she's well acquainted, you know, with, with, it, it, it is when she's well armed with some education, you know, that she'll be able to impact her community positively, that she can be able to, you know, contribute to this decision making positively you know is is not not until we you know we eradicate this uh, barbaric thinking there are some culture that actually repugnant you know to natural justice to rural women take for instance you know some rural women to acquire property to even acquire some portion of land you know in their communities to farm is a problem you know, and why? Simply because they are women. Simply because you know, they are, they they, they are, uh, uh, you know they don't mingle well with the so to say rural women, which is not supposed to be so. I see this as discrimination. I see this as stereotyping. We really have a whole lot to do, you know, on our rural women. But then, you know, we can make it one step at a time. I believe we can make it one step at a time. You know, when we improve the well-being of their family. You know, because these people, they do face serious challenges. They do face serious challenges, food, basic amenities, education, finances, training, empowerment training, you know, that can link them to opportunities, that can link their children to opportunities. They don't have it. Our laws are always against these people. These people are seen as the downtrodden. They are seen as the forgotten ones in the society. Um, so I definitely can. Um, could I cut you um, there? Um, you talked about property acquisition, property ownership um, of rural women. Yeah. Now, um, is this also relating to some of the widowhood rights that um, prevent them from acquiring properties upon the demise of their husband? Is that a relationship with this particular subject matter and this situation, because um, reports have had it over and over again where women are deprived from property acquisition and also, is this, is this some form of, um, is this something that you think is related to this particular question? Of course, it's interwoven. Women, rural women, in fact, women at large have gone through a whole lot. They, they, you know, they are always the one at the receiving end. They are all, especially these rural women, they are always the one at the receiving end. You know, when it comes to sharing, you know, like, like our society, our society, in fact, should I even say 90% of the world at large, you know, we practice patriarchal system, you know, whereby we place the male, the male, the male actually play a dominant role, you know, in the society, you know, talk about politics, talk about leadership, talk about moral authorities, you know, talk about, talk about social privilege. Yes, they are always at the receiving end. There is no cruel treatment that have not been melted out against this woman. Similarly, the widow, 
our laws of widowhood, you know, our practice of widow system is not really favorable to most of our women, especially the rural women at all. There is no law stopping a woman. There's no law stopping a rural woman, you know, from not acquiring property. No, there is no law. You know, most of these things just, just anchored on our cultural belief because the culture have really relegated the women. You know, even, even the exposed one are still struggling. You know, they are still struggling, you know, to, to, for equal opportunities. Then how much less the one in the village, the rural woman, you can imagine what they will be going through. It's not funny. So most of our law really needs to be reformed. The ones that are already in place needs to be implemented in favor of this woman. You know, so many things we should converse arguments against. And then I'm glad that, you know, some women are beginning, you know, you know, they are fast becoming paradigm shifters. Yes, they are fast becoming paradigm shifters. They are beginning to speak up for these ones. They are beginning to advocate for these forgotten ones, you know, so that some of our laws will accommodate them. So that some of our cultural belief, those old archaic mentality, we all so dear, they are not really favorable to them. So that we start eliminating them. So that we start abolishing them and then we find a way to bring in this one we find a way of giving them sense of inclusion you know this this women are part of some 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 rural women you know they work in fact they work other than their men which is true most of these women you know they are the breadwinner and then when it comes to sharing formula they are the ones that are receiving them they are the ones being left out that's not fair that's not fair. That's not actually the society we create. So it's incumbent on us, it's incumbent on our laws, it's incumbent on our cultural belief, you know, to include these women, you know, to make them participate in, in policy decision making. You know, it's incumbent on us, you know, to give them a better life. These women are not even asking for too much. Some of these women are not really asking for too much, you know, just include them give them education, give their children education, encourage them with finances and all that. And they are good. But, but, but you see, some of our laws are not really helping matters. Some of us, even as women, we are not really helping matters. We have a way of stereotyping these ones. Even, you know, the same gender with us, we don't really have mercy on them. You need to see what widows go through in Nigeria when they lost their husband. And one of the most painful aspects is most of these ill treatments are not even melted out by the opposite sex. It's by their own fellow gender. You know, women wounding women. You know, that's when they start bringing in, you know, subjugating belief, you know, that doesn't favor the woman. Why? Just to water down this, this woman's rights. Just, just to make sure, you know, they have no voice. Just to make sure they have no share. Just to make sure they deprive them you know, of anything that can actually be favorable to them, that can actually be favorable to this woman. And check out this woman, they are bitter. They are not happy, you know? So it, we need to put proper machineries in place to cater for them. Mr. Defunke, can you hear us? Okay, um, I guess the network has kicked her out. Um, she should be back shortly. So having established all of this fact, um, it's, it seems as though the same narrative is operational in all countries across the globe, or most of the countries across the globe. Um, because from our representatives from India, Malaysia, Kenya, and of course, Nigeria, um, they all seem to be singing the same song, rural women are not being taken care of, um, although some governments have gone way ahead um, to ensure that their wealth or standard of living is improved, but there is still more to be done. At this point, the floor is open for us to ask our questions. You could send it as a text through the chat, or you could unmute yourself and send in your questions or ask your various questions. So feel free to ask your questions. If there are no questions, we'll just go ahead um, with the rest part of the program. Thank you.
Feel free to mute your mic and ask your questions. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. If it's afternoon, wherever you are. Um, actually, I just want to add to the what the last speaker has said. You know, that's about the plight of women, especially in the rural area. When you talk about women at times working harder than their male counterparts, it's not just in the rural area, even in the urban areas, a lot of women work much harder you know, in the family to support their children even more, more than the men do. And um, when you talk about women in the room, as legal practitioners, as uh, your legal practitioners, I've often wondered when you organize talks like this, this kind of talk, this platform is to address issues that relate to women, especially we're talking about the rural women. After this talk, when this whole discussion is over, how do you reach out to these women? Because especially when, you know, most meetings now, if not 90% of meetings held now are virtual because of this pandemic. How do these women get this message? How do you give them that part in the back to reassure them that yes, you're, you're there, you know, for them, you empathize with them, you know. And um, uh, the lady who spoke from India, I must say that, you know, um, the rape issue that goes on in India is, is more like a canker worm. It's really pathetic. I know there was a time that the women, you know, protested. I think 2012 or something like that was a, a big protest, but then it's not abated. It still, it still goes on even up to this year. You know, it's not just raping women, but gang raping women, raping women to the point of death. When you think of all the issues that one is surrounded by, you just think, why would it be rape that should be, that should be the, you know, be in the minds of, you know, people like that. So my question is, as legal practitioners, you are in the position, you are, you're supposed, you, yourself, the people in the media are the voice of the voiceless. How do you get this message across? How do you assure these women that, look, you are there to protect their interests. You are there for them and you understand what they are going through. But because I, honestly, the women we're talking about, if not almost 100% of them, don't even know what we're talking about. They don't even know that this is going on because of where they are. Yes. So how do you get this message across to yes, them? Yes, yes, yes. So thank you so much for your such an elaborate question. And I'll answer it in quite some parts. So firstly, you asked, and of course, I'd be stating instances only from India. So uh, initially, you asked that uh, since, we, since everything is happening online on such webinars, how are we going to take this up to the rural women, number one? And then number two, I'd be discussing the rape issue specifically in India and how we are trying to cater to it now. And the third question being, as a legal practitioner, how, how and what sorts of help am I able to provide rural women in specific and in rape cases, as you already stated. So first thing being that, you know, what personally warms my heart, seeing that we have multiple laws in place to protect the rights of the women. What is more heartwarming for me to see is that people like you and me, urban women itself, they are utilizing their well, knowledge we to see and is taking, people like you and me. They're utilizing their skill, their tact, and taking it up and helping the rural women. And one eminent example of this is, which is the very recent thing that's coming up to my mind, and there are more so many like this. this. So uh, there's this famous fashion designer in India named Anita Dongre, and you could Google this up. She has created her own sister brand uh, titled Grassroots, where she only employs women 
from rural areas and she uh, you know uh, ensures them employment and grants them literally parts of her own profit and we can be good consumers as well knowing that you know uh, whatever proceeds that we're giving out to purchase those dresses are going to these rural women also this lady by hiring these rural women is recognizing traditional knowledge which is a huge intellectual property right and uh, that has been an ongoing debate and mentioned under the trips agreement as well so while she's you know giving these people employment she's employing them in her entire industry of making lehengas and different other costumes uh, she's recognizing that traditional knowledge and giving them their due so this is the reason how you and i in our respective fields can go ahead and help the rural women me personally if you ask me being a legal practitioner how can i help these women so i have started a recent instagram handle and i'm trying to uh, just create a space for myself online as well so that more and more people can reach me so you know just like every other corporation this is these are my personal takes you know so just like every corporation has to do certain kind of csr i feel it's my social responsibility also to give back to the society in a certain way so while state college we actually used to have a legal aid cell where we used to go to various uh, villages in uttar pradesh and uh, because my college was also situated in the state of uttar pradesh we used to go there and literally stand there do multiple nukkar nataks or dramatic representation of what indian laws are for women so this was something i was doing back in college time and now i have just created a portal where i'm easily accessible and trust me on the on a daily basis i get multiple messages stating that women are facing domestic violence or any other kind of harassment at workplace and those kind of issues and uh, i'm just of course a voice note away on instagram and that's how i i'm helping them of course i'm sure most of these women are also belonging to uh, rural uh, uh, stratas as well along with the urban stratas so i'm hoping to make a change that way coming over to your last and final question since your question was as elaborate uh, the rape laws in india so like you said and like i also said in my keynote speech that in 2012 a massive protest occurred and gang rape tips uh, to the level that they are actually strangulating women and killing them are occurring still today It, one just happened uh, this last month which was called the hatras rape case and, and i would not like to paint a very flowery picture and discuss this in its entirety so crimes against women are prevalent as far as the laws are concerned right after 2012 uh stricter death penalties were formulated also uh, and they were given out to all those six accused besides one who was a juvenile so then the juvenile justice act was also amended in 2012 which stated that if a juvenile who's 16 and above because otherwise a juvenile is somebody who's 18 and below you know below 18 not 18 and below below 18 but now if a 16 year old 17 year old or and a 17 plus year old who's not yet 18 is committing rape on a woman he can equally be tried like an adult and this was the major ruling that the uh, supreme court gave out in this particular regard so we are changing step by step and of course as a woman i believe i'm coming from a state of privilege that i'm not able to face the picture of it and as and when time comes i actually have plans of uh, filing in certain public interest litigations as well thank you so much um so i think india i would not say doing the best of the best jobs uh, but it is on the way of rising uh, women empowerment in multiple ways and we have to give india due credits uh, for it so i hope that answers your question Thank you so much Sanduja for that very comprehensive response. Um so we have lots of questions trickling in. Um one of the speakers or one of the um questions reads one minute please guys. Uh Okay so I have a question for all three panelists. What would be your recommendation suggestions on how the government can assist the rural women in your respective countries? in terms of economic development for themselves so we'll start with um patricia from kenya what are your recommendations i mean you have a background in international commercial law so 
you you um you should be able to tell us um especially when it comes to issues of economic development so what is uh what would be your recommendation for the kenyan government to be able to assist this rural women aside the cooperative scheme you highlighted So um, one of my recommendations um, in comes to the economic sector, as I mentioned, the, um, the main issue is uh, it's tied down with the land ownership. So uh, already in Kenya, we have various laws the constitution, from the constitution to various acts that protect uh, women against, um, uh, they give them the various rights, but now the problem the problem is now the enforcement and the, you focus more on the implementation of the various laws and the um, enforcement and also the sensitization of the women when it comes to their rights. So if because the women, the rural women, like they, the rights are there, but most of them you find they are not aware they, or they do not know of uh, the laws that they have been given or they find or maybe even if you read to them, they may not understand the laws. So sensitization will be um, efficient um, if the government does more sensitization. Um, also in the economic sector, agriculture being the main economic activity, the government can invest more and can give more training to the women because actually women in Kenya, generally women in Kenya are the majority, the rural women, rural women are the majority in Kenya in terms of the women. So, and they're the major workforce and they're the ones who work the most. So if they're, hard work can be quantified, like um, the hard work can now be made commercial because now their hard work mainly, you'll find that their caregivers of their family, they fetch firewood, like if the infrastructure, the government can increase the infrastructure such that they don't have to work so hard to obtain the basic needs that they need for for example, water, um, uh, firewood, like a rural woman will highly improve. So if the government can improve their services, uh, the Kenyan government can improve their services and also sensitization, please, we will continue to improve. All right, and thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Patricia, for um, those recommendations. Um, we hope that sooner or later the government of Kenya will embrace these recommendations and run with them in order to make the standard of living of rural women better. Um, so the next question would be to um, Claudia. So what, what are your recommendations um, to the government of Malaysia when it comes to economic development of rural women? Okay. Um... So thank you, Natalia, for your question. Um, so I would say that um, some of the key considerations uh, for the government maybe to implement these policies are maybe to address the needs of these vulnerable um, parties, you know, these vulnerable people, um, maybe keep them at the center of policy efforts in, in the immediate term because, um, I mean, they've been the most vulnerable and, and for the longer term um, self because self-employment and non-standard employment relationships um, have increasingly uh, represented the future of work. Policies should be gender sensitive, I think. Um, and the basically you should be harness, we should be harnessing the potentials of youth um, and addressing youth unemployment because most of the rural women in Malaysia, um, the statistics somewhere, I'm sorry, I, I don't have it right now, but the statistics have shown that most of the rural women in Malaysia are, are quite um, young as well in their 30s, uh, no, 20s to 30s. So yeah, addressing that would be a good thing. Um, the government will need to maybe put um, institutional um, me mechanisms, arrangements to coordinate uh, the responses of all the ministries and the federal and state and local levels. Um, maybe 
a social dialogue to, to play a, a central role in developing and implementing these policies. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot more needs to be done um, in order to like keep them in a central role, um, keep them at the center of, of developing these. Um, Thank you so much, Claudia, for your um, recommendations. Um, so we'll be moving over to the next panelist, who um, is Mrs. Ade Funke. So Madam In, one minute, um, could you just summarize what some of your recommendations would be for the Nigerian government, um, considering the fact that there is a need to provide economic development for women in the rural areas? Mr. Defunke, can you hear us? Okay, while she's trying to um, start out the network, um, Nishta Sanduja, in one minute, could you wrap up and just tell us um, some of the recommendations you would be giving or offering to the Indian government to ensure that there is economic development for rural women? Yes. So uh, my first recommendation should be that there's this already, there's this pan-India scheme ongoing, which is called MG Narega, which is Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee uh, Scheme. And we require to have more such schemes. Uh, so this scheme primarily grants 100 days of employment to rural men and women. Uh, uh, in this entire one year span in order to boost them further, in order to not uh, let them be become destitutes. And uh, so, so that is one scheme. And the government needs to have more such schemes in place. There's another one, Mahila Koyar Yojana. So Koyar is that outer, uh, you know, layer of uh, coconut. And uh, a lot many women, rural women in the coastal areas are uh, employed in this Koyar field. So they make uh, bed, bed sheets, beddings out of it, baskets out of it, caskets out of it. Multiple things are being made out of this coconut skin. So the government specifically has provided them uh, with this particular opportunity that if they are wanting to self-employ themselves in this choir related work, they uh, provide certain cash incentives to these women and let them settle themselves independently so that they are financially independent towards the end of the day. So we want more such schemes, number one. And number two, and the final recommendation to the government of actually every other country has to be, because everybody has spoken about uh, intrinsic patriarchal concerns, the gender norms in place. So, you know, our women will get truly independent financially only when we actually tell them and reach out to them and tell them why do they need to be one. Because it's only when they are financially independent are they able to, you know, bolster the support of other women and talk about their concerns in a workforce. They're able to go away from the family. So then they get a, a strength and a decision making power even within the families only when they're financially independent. So there should be these kind of counseling centers in place that are going up to women, rural women in person and telling them why is it that they need to earn their own money. So those are the two recommendations from my end. Thank you so much, um, Nishta Sanjuja. Um, Mrs. Adefunke, can you hear us? Okay. Thank so, you, thank you, Glad. All right. Um, so I guess the network is not very favorable from her end. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it was indeed an insightful and informative session although with few technical hitches here and there, but we made um, use of the time. Um, so we will not be able to end this session without appreciating some unique group of individuals. And now um, these are our numerous partners. Without them, we will not have been able to um, have this session. So the first on our list is Atlantic Resource Recruitment. Now this is a resource, um, this is a recruitment firm in Cardiff, United Kingdom, and they offer recruitment services for various um, roles. The next is Big J's Culinary School in Abuja. Um, of course, as the name implies, it's a culinary school that provides skills for those who intend to become chefs 
and what have you. And the next is Reformers League in Nigeria. Reformers League um, is a non-governmental organization that gets towards eradication of drug abuse, corruption in the country. And um, they intend to do this by empowering the youths. The next on our list is Kabika Empowerment Center. This is a non-governmental organization located in Abuja that gets towards combating domestic violence by providing psychosocial support for victims. The next is Faith a Life Driven Campaign Initiative. They get towards combating issues of teenage pregnancies and also helping teenage mothers get back to school. So in other words, a lady is pregnant, it's not the end of the world. You could still pick up your life and move on. Um, the next is Orphan School. So provide soccer to orphans and the less privileged. Um, our next partner is Lehi Attorneys. Um, it's a group of lawyers that deal with um, corporate affairs issues. And the good thing with Lehi Attorneys is that they are offering free company registration to one participant. So I'll let us know how we could um, get into the draw to win this particular um, prize. The next is Lukachi. Lukachi is offering a virtual internship for, um, for fashion lovers. Um, they are a fashion firm in Nigeria that have dressed some of your A-list um, fashion lovers. The next is AQB Legal. It's a legal firm located in Abuja. And then we have Five Kobo Transport. This is a transportation firm that provides airport pickups, um, your personal rides, and what have you. They're located in Abuja, Nigeria. The next on our list is Cyper Africa. Cyper is Center for Youth Participation, Dialogue, and Advocacy. Um, as the name implies, they provide a situation whereby youth can get involved in governance, um, they can understand the app in policy analysis, and Cypher is offering free virtual mentorship in policy analysis for as many participants as possible. The next is the fellowship. The fellowship is a group of young professionals and entrepreneurs that come together to strengthen one another. The next, which is our official media partner, is New Generation Lawyers all the way from New Delhi, India. This is a group of lawyers and law students that um, always hold lectures every once in a while to refresh their memories and help them broaden their horizon when it comes to issues of law. The next is Inglis Arts. Inglis Arts, I would really like to thank them for customizing the t-shirt I have on, which is branded Human Rights Attorney. They are your branding or go-to branding guides in Abuja. And the last but not the least, is NZC48. Um, the flyer which we had posted yesterday were from this guy. They are really amazing and good at what they do. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, for those who would like to partake in the virtual internship or win the prize for the free company registration, you can send me a WhatsApp message to plus 234-8131-901203 or send an email to humanrightsattorneys2020 at gmail.com. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your time. We think this is the last webinar for the year, but fingers crossed as issues continue to rise, we'll continue to speak up when it comes to issues of human rights. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend.